Hello everyone, thank you very much for signing in and watching my live stream. Welcome to SAT ACT Prep. I'm Mr. Matt and this is Dr. Tot. And first of all, I just wanted to thank all of you very much for all of your support. Um, we got over 100 subscribers, so we did obtain our custom URL. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. And so I'm going to, I think everybody got my email, but let me just post this in the chat function so everybody has it so you can write that down subscribe to my channel that's the permanent link so whenever I'm um, broadcasting you can always find me um, there if you miss a session then my recordings will be uploaded to that channel as well and if you have any questions just comment um, in that specific video and I'll be sure to get back to you so again thank you very much I really appreciate it this has been a rather long journey, but it's, I'm so excited about it, um, and it's a new venture. Uh, it's challenging, and getting all these technological components together is not my forte. I've had the wonderful help of a very talented administrator, so um, had a lot of support here, and this has been um, a cool journey, so thank you guys very much. Um, so we're going to continue today in session two, the mixed review of arithmetic. So far, we've talked about the rules of exponents. We've talked about solving conceptually and solving using substitution. We've also talked about the LCM, least common uh, multiple, and the GCF, the greatest common factor, and how to calculate those values. So let's go ahead and just get right into some practice problems. Let me share my screen with you. And so I'm just going to give you two minutes to look over the problem yourself. Then I'll give you some hints, and then we'll review. Um, if we run out of questions, I'm going to go back and take recommendations. I've um, written about 11 novel original questions here, but if we have more time, then we absolutely will just go through some more examples. So the first question. If 64 raised to the a power times 32 raised to the b power is equal to 16 raised to the c power times 64 raised to the d power, what is the value of b in terms of a, c, and d? And I'll keep track of the time here. Do another color. Uh, let's do like purple. So let's do two minutes and then I'll start, I'll give you a few hints.
Okay, so let's talk about this question. First of all, in this equation, we definitely have bases raised to exponents and we're multiplying, and that sounds like the second rule of exponents that we've gone through, excuse me, this first rule of exponents that we went through before in the previous sessions, knowing that common bases raised to exponents when multiplying, we can keep the base, add the exponents. Here though, we don't have common bases, and that violates the principle, the fundamental rule of the rules of all of the rules of exponents. So we're not allowed to use any of those rules until we get all of the bases to be equivalent. So ask yourself, is there a number that you can exponentiate or raise to different powers and get 64, 32, and 16, or 16? And there is a value. Um, this is a little bit tricky because 16 and 64 might lead you down the pathway of thinking um, that you need to use a base of 4, but if we investigate that a little bit, notice that 4 to the first power is 4, 4 squared is 16, so that works for 16, 4 cubed is 16 times 4, that's 64, and that's also another one of our values. We definitely have 16 and 64, but notice how it jumps over 32. So we can't use uh, 4 here. However, 4 is an exponenti excuse me, exponentiation of another number, 2. 4 is 2 squared, so instead of 4, let's check out 2. 2 to the first power is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, 2 to the fourth power is 16, 2 to the fifth power is 32, and 2 to the sixth power is 64. So I would first rewrite all of these bases in terms of a base of 2. So for example, instead of 64, I'm going to put parentheses 2 to the 6th power. Now that's still raised to the a power. So you have to substitute using parentheses. And notice that's going to turn into a power over power, which we can multiply. 32 to the b power, instead of writing 32, I'm going to write 2 to the 5th power, quantity raised to the b power. Instead of 16, I'm going to write 2 to the 4th, quantity raised to the c power. And instead of 64, I'm going to write 2 to the 6th power, quantity raised to the d power. And when they're asking for b in terms of a, c, and d, that's just a really fancy way of saying get b by itself. So if you multiply the powers of the powers out, you'll be able to then add the exponents because you have common bases. Then you'll be able to drop the bases and equate the exponents. And then you can use your standard algebraic processes in order to isolate b on one side of, of the equation. Once you do that, whatever is on the other side, including the a, C and D will be your answer. Okay, so I'm going to give you two more minutes and then I'll give you the solution. I'll keep track of the time in green.
Okay, so we have powers of powers here. So 2 to the 6th power quantity raised to the a power, that's the same thing as 2 to the 6th times a power, which is the same thing as 2 to the 6th a power. So this is going to eliminate, or simplify rather, into 2 to the 6th a power times 2 to the 5 b power. Remember, this is just following the third rule of exponents, a power over power. Whenever you exponentiate a quantity already raised to a, a power, you can just multiply the exponents together. On the right-hand side, 2 to the 4th quantity raised to the c is going to be 2 to the 4 times c, which is 2 to the 4c, times 2 to the 6th quantity raised to the d power. That's going to be 2 to the 6th times d power, which is 2 to the 6th d power. Now we have common bases raised to exponents and we're multiplying, so we can keep the base, add the exponents. So we're going to keep the base of 2, add 6a plus 5b, set that equal to the right hand side, keep the base of 2, add the exponents of 4c plus 6d. Now, we have common bases raised to exponents on opposite sides of an equal sign. So we can drop the bases and equate the exponents directly. So we know that 6a plus 5b must be equal to 4c plus 6d. And the name of the game here, they say, is to isolate for b, or at least that's what they're asking for. So I'm going to subtract away 6a. In order to understand what I should do first, my goal is to get b by itself. My first question would be, is b, the only, is, is b located in only one area of this equation? In other words, is there more than one b? So here we don't have that situation. There's only one b and it's 5b. What is, six, what is preventing b from being by itself? There's two things. It's the positive 6a that's adding to the 5b, and then there's that coefficient of 5 that's multiplying into the b. So we're going to unwrap these by doing opposite algebraic operations. 6a is adding into 5b, so I'm going to subtract away 6a on both sides. When I do that, that's going to cancel on the left, leaving me with just 5b. And then because on the right-hand side there's no other monomial that has a variable of a, we can't eliminate this directly with any other value. It's just going to tag along on the right-hand side. So this is going to be 4c plus 6d minus 6a. And it could be in any order there. Um, it could be negative 6a plus 4c plus 6d. The order doesn't matter. And then the last thing that's keeping b from being isolated is that 5. What is 5 doing to b? It's multiplying into b. So we need to do the opposite. We're going to divide both sides by 5. When we do that, the 5 cancel on the left-hand side. So our answer for b is going to be 4c plus 6d minus 6a quantity divided by 5. And I need you to recognize that that's exactly equivalent oops, sorry, to if I, if I individually applied that denominator to the numerator separately. So for example, this is the same thing as 4 fifths C plus 6 fifths D minus 6 fifths A. And I need you to also recognize that that's the exact same thing as 4c over 5 plus 6d over 5 minus 6a over 5. Those are all equivalent terms. So as long as you got one of these values or one of these expressions, then I am absolutely happy. Oops, that's not correct. And as always, if you have any questions at all, please let me know in either the live chat function or you can drop a comment in the comment section below. If not, let's move on to number two. So I'm testing you here. Um, this is quite an exponent problem. So I'm going to give you three minutes at first and then I'm going to start you off on the first few steps and then give you some more um, time to finish through. The problem here says, what is the value of 
and it's a huge quantity, the whole thing, after I list all, or after I um, say this whole value, the whole thing is raised to the second power. So there's brackets on the outside of this complex fraction that is raising the entire thing to the second power. But we have the quantity 25 squared times the quantity 125 raised to the fifth power, total quantity raised to the third power. That's the numerator. Divided by the quantity 625 squared times the quantity 25 cubed, whole quantity squared, that quantity is the denominator. And then we have total brackets, like I said in the beginning, on the outside of this complete fraction, which is squaring the whole thing. So I'm going to give you three minutes. Start breaking this down. Remember that you need common uh, bases in order to use any of the rules of exponents. But once you have common bases, this will simplify greatly. And I'd like you to leave your answer in exponential form. So you don't need to evaluate it for an actual numeric, fa um, numeric value. You can just leave it in like 25 squared, 7 cubed, whatever the answer may be. Leave it in exponential form. Okay, three minutes, and then I'll give you some hints. Okay, so let me start you off here. First of all, we need to get these bases listed in equivalent terms. What number can we exponentiate or raise to different powers in order to get 25, 125, and 625? Well, the answer is 5, because 5 to the first power is 5, 
5 squared is 25, 5 cubed is 125, and 5 to the fourth power, or in other words, another name for that is the quartic power of 5, is 625. And so now we just need to replace all of those non-common bases with these common exponentiations in terms of 5. Instead of writing 25, I'm going to write 5 squared. That's still raised to the second power. So we have 5 squared quantity squared. Instead of writing 125, I'm going to write 5 cubed. That's still raised to the fifth power. And then this whole thing is x, the whole numerator is x, uh, exponentiated to the third power. Quantity over, so that's the numerator, now let's deal with the denominator. Instead of 625, I'm going to write 5 to the fourth power, but that's still raised to the second power. So I have 5 to the fourth quantity raised to the second. Instead of writing 25, I'm going to write 5 squared, but that's still raised to the third power, so now I have 5 squared quantity cubed. The whole denominator is also squared. So that guy's on the outside, and now I have entire brackets around the whole fraction, which is squaring that value of that whole quantity. So let's continue working on the inside. Now we have powers of powers, so I can multiply. So this is going to turn into 5 to the 4th times 5 to the 15th, quantity raised to the third power divided by, so that's the numerator, the denominator is going to be 5 to the 8th power times 5 to the 6th power. Whole thing quantity squared. Whole denominator quantity squared, and then we still have those entire brackets around the whole fraction squaring it. Now inside the parentheses for the numerator and denominator we have multiplication with common bases raised to exponents. So we know we can keep the base, add the exponents. So in the numerator we're going to have 5 to the 4 plus 15 power. So this is going to turn into 5 to the 19th power, quantity raised to the third power, divided by 5 to the 8 plus 6 is going to be 5 to the 14th power, Quantity, quantity squared, so the whole denominator squared, and then we still have these brackets squaring on the outside. I'm going to give you two more minutes. I'd like you to complete this problem, and then I'll give you the answer.
Okay, so let's look at this. Okay. So continuing here, now we have powers of powers. So in the numerator, we have fifth, uh, excuse me, five to the 19th power quantity raised to the third power. So that's equal to five to the 19 times three power. 19 times three is 57. So this is going to get the same color here. It's going to turn into five to the 57th power divided by five to the 14 quantity raised to the second, that's equal to five to the 14 times two powers, so that's five to the 28th power. Quantity, and then we still have these brackets here, quantity squared. Now, we have common bases raised to exponents and we're dividing, so we can keep the base, subtract the exponents. So this is gonna turn into five to the 57 minus 28 power, quantity squared. 57 minus 28, that's going to give us a 29. Yes. And then 29 times two is going to be 58. So our final answer is going to be five to the 58th power, which is a very large number. If you have any questions, please, please, please let me know. Otherwise, let's take a look at three. So number three asks, if A and B are positive primes greater than two and C is even, which of the following statements is or are true? Number one, statement number one is A plus B plus C is even. Number two is A times B is odd. Number three is 2A times 3B plus quantity plus 5C is odd. So that last one, 2A times 3B plus 5C is odd. Remember, just a little bit of a preview here. Um, there's two ways to solve this. You can solve using substitution or you can solve conceptually. Using substitution, your first objective is to identify the domain of each of these variables. That means the acceptable values that you're allowed to use for each of them. And that's just dependent on the definition they particularly use um, when describing A, B, and C. So they're talking about positive primes greater than 2 for A and B. You can pick numbers that satisfy that, those characteristics. And then C is even, so you can pick an even number. Now when you're picking values, you're assuming numbers make the math easy on yourself, or be easy on yourself and pick easy numbers to work with. You don't need to choose extremely large numbers because it's only going to make the calculation harder. Then you can substitute those acceptable values into the um, statements that are listed and check the veracity of each statement, che check whether they're true or not. Um, that's using substitution. That's the fallback method that I would like you to be able to rely upon, but I want you to work towards solving conceptually because it's oftentimes a lot faster. You can solve conceptually here by thinking about what does it mean to be a positive prime number greater than 2. There's a specific characteristic that would apply to all prime numbers greater than 2 because 2 happens to be a very special prime number and if you think back to our video on properties of 2 you might be able to think of that. C they define to be even so you can just go through the operations conceptually an even plus an even is an even, an odd plus an odd is an odd so on and so forth. So I mean, odd plus an odd is an even, and even plus an odd is an odd, um, so on and so forth. And you can just do a little thought experiment uh, in your mind. So I'll give you two minutes, and then I'll give you some hints.
Okay, so let's look at this. So if a and b are positive primes greater than 2, remember 2 is the only even prime number. So every other prime number has to be odd. That's a really tricky way of just saying that a and b are odd numbers. So if we know a and b are, excuse me, a and b are odd numbers and c is an even number, we can use that conceptually in order to solve. If we didn't understand that, we would be able to use substitution to plug in and evaluate each statement um, as being true or false. So for example, if we wanted to use substitution, I might say that a, whoops, let's let a be equal to 3 and b be equal to 5 and let's say c is equal to 2. That satisfies the domain or the acceptable restriction or the, the definition um, of a, b, and c. That a and b are odd, they're positive prime numbers greater than 2, and c is an even number. 2 is even. So you can plug these numbers in and evaluate as to whether these statements are true or not. That's always available to you. So what I want to show you is how to solve here conceptually, which is a little bit faster. So if I know that a and b are odd and c is even, then this really just turns into odd plus odd plus even. An odd plus an odd, think about it, 5 plus 5, 3 plus 3, 9 plus 9. An odd plus an odd is going to be an even. So the odd plus odd gives us even. That leaves us with an even plus an even, which is going to give us an even number. So statement number one is true. Statement number two, again, a and b are odd, so this really is just the same thing as an odd number times an odd number. Three times three, three times five, an odd times an odd is definitely another odd number. So statement two is also true. Statement 3, 2a times 3b plus 5c is odd. So this is just adding a whole bunch of other numbers in here. But 2 is an even number. So we have an even times a, which is an odd, times 3, which is odd, times b, which is odd, plus 5, which is odd, times c, which is even. So now we can just break these down pair by pair. An even times an odd is going to be an even number. Think of 3 times 4, that's 12. An odd times an odd is going to be an odd number. Think like 3 times 3 or 3 times 5, 7 times 3. And plus this, an odd times an even, that's going to be an even. Now an even times an odd is going to be an even. An even plus an even number will always result in an even answer. So statement three is false. So our answer here is going to be statements one and two only. And let me scroll, just leave this here. I want to make sure that you can see that outside of my camera. I know my camera's a little bit in the way there. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, let's move on. Okay, this question is another challenging question. Just go from the math that we've been working with. I know that seeing a double exponent is super weird. Just go with the math, the operations, the rules of exponents that we've been practicing, and a lot of stuff you'll see um, will either simplify or become much clearer. So I'll give you two minutes, and then I'll give you some hints here.
Okay, so number four says, if b raised to the y power raised to the second power, so b raised to the y squared power, divided by b raised to the quantity of x squared plus y squared power is equal to b to the negative fourth power, what is the value of x if x must be greater than zero? So this looks very strange to see a power of a power or to see an exponent in the exponent's location, but just go about it using the normal algebraic processes that you're used to. When we have common bases, here we have a base of b and a base of b. If you have common bases raised to exponents and you're dividing those values, you can keep the base, subtract the exponents. So this is going to turn into b to the y squared power minus the quantity x squared plus y squared. And that's equal to b to the negative fourth power. Now you just need to make sure that you distribute this negative to both values inside of the parentheses. Once you do that, some things will be able to cancel out. Then you'll have common bases on opposite sides of an equal sign, so you'll be able to drop the bases and relate or compare the exponents directly, which will allow you to solve for y. And then also just be aware that if x must be greater than zero, this, this equation is actually going to turn into a result in two different outputs, but only one of which is going to be greater than zero. So just be careful about that. I'll give you two more minutes and then I'll give you the answer. Okay, so when we distribute that negative sign to everything inside the parentheses, we're going to get b raised to the y squared power minus x squared minus y squared is equal to b to the negative fourth power. Positive y squared and negative y squared will cancel. And so this will leave us with b to the negative x squared power is equal to b to the negative 4 power. Now we have common bases on opposite sides of an equal sign, so we can drop the bases and equate the exponents directly. So negative x squared is equal to negative 4. Dividing or multiplying, whichever you want to think about it as, 
Um, dividing or multiplying on both sides by negative 1 will flip the signs of both sides. So positive x squared will be equal to positive 4. Taking the square root of both sides, because I don't want x squared, I want just x. When I take the square root of both sides, I have to consider the positive and the negative results. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of positive 4. The square root of 4 is 2, so my answers are plus or minus 2. But because x has to be greater than 0, the answer can only be positive 2. If you have any questions, then please let me know. Otherwise, let's continue on. Number five asks, what is the sum of the largest factor and smallest multiple of the following set of numbers? 12, 18, 30, and 75. I'll give you two minutes and then I'll give you some hints. Okay, so if we're trying to find the largest factor, that's another phrase that we could use to describe the greatest common factor, the GCF. And the smallest multiple is another phrase that's synonymous with the least common multiple, the LCM. So we need to find the GCF and the LCM of 12, 18, 30, and 75. So the first step is to factorize all of your terms. So I'm going to break these into their prime components. 12 turns into 3 times 4. 3 is prime, so I'm going to circle it and I stop. 4 breaks down into 2 times 2. 18 can be broken down into 3 times 6. 3 is prime. 6 can be broken down into 2 times 3. 30 can be broken down into 5 times 6. 5 is prime. 6 can be broken down into 2 times 3. And 75 can be broken down into 3 times 25. 3 is prime, and 25 can be broken down into 5 times 5, which are both prime. Remember, in order to calculate the LCM, we take each factor the most number of times that occurs in any one factorization. We have four factorizations here. So we're going to take 
each factor, we're going, to go, we're going to go factor by factor and take each factor the most number of times it occurs in any one factorization. So for example, 2 occurs one time, in, excuse me, 2 occurs 2 times in 12, 1 time in 18, 1 time in 30, 0 times in 75. So 2 is the most number of times 2 is used in any one factorization, so I'm going to take two twos. Now moving on to 3. 3 occurs once in 12, twice in 18, once in 30, and once in 75. So 2 is the most number of times that 3 is used in any one factorization. So I'm, I'm going to take two threes. And then we just need to consider 5. 5 is used 0 times in 12, 0 times in 18, 1 time in 30, but 2 times in 75. So I'm going to take 2 5's because 2 is the most number of times that 2 is used in any one factorization. So if we were to multiply these values together, we would get 900. So the least common multiple, the smallest value that 12, 18, 30, and 75 can multiply into exactly is 900. Now in order to solve for the GCF, we're going to take each factor the least number of times it occurs in any one factorization. So starting over with 2. 2 occurs twice in 12, once in 18, once in 30, zero times in 75. So we're going to take zero twos because zero is the least number of times two was used because it wasn't used at all in 75. So we're going to take no twos. Now let's move on to three. Three is used once, excuse me, three is used once in 12, two times in 18, once in 30, and once in 75. So 1 is the least number of times 3 is used in any one factorization. So I'm going to take 1, 3. And then 5, 5 is used 0 times in 12, 0 times in 18, 1 time in 30, and 2 times in 75. So 0 is the most number of times that uh, 5 is used in any one factorization, so we are going to take 0 5's. So the GCF is 3. The sum of the LCM and the GCF would just be 900 plus 3, so that's going to be 903, or 903. If you have any questions, then please let me know. Number six, what number less than 1,000 has a remainder of three when divided by four, five, and six? And there could be more than one answer here. Some gridding questions have either a range of values that are acceptable um, because the computer that reads the Scantron sheet that you submit for your grid-ins is obviously also a calculator, so it can do equivalent terms and it can do conversions. Um, and then sometimes, so it can lie within a range of acceptable values, or there could be a distinct set um, of solutions for a specific problem. Usually most SAT and ACT problems have one answer. Every once in a while there's more than one acceptable value. Okay, I'll give you two minutes, then I'll give you some hints.
Okay, so when they say they're looking for a number less than a thousand that has a remainder of three when divided by four, five, and six. The remainder of three part sounds really, really tricky, and it's meant to sound tricky and intimidating. First, why don't you find a number that has a remainder of zero when divided by four, five, and six? Or in other words, why don't you find a number that is a direct multiple of all numbers four, five, and six? If you add three to that value, then you would have a number that had a remainder of three. The problem is, is that you need to find a value where they all meet first, and then you can project forward with the re intended remainder that you want your answer to have. Here, first find the LCM of 4, 5, and 6 by factorizing the values. 4 breaks down into 2 and 2. 5 is already prime. 6 breaks down into 2 and 3. So the LCM, taking each value or each factor the most number of times it occurs in any one factorization, 2 occurs twice in 4, 0 times in 5, once in 6. So I'm going to take two twos. 5 occurs 0 times in 4, 1 time in 5, 0 times in 6. So I'm going to take 1, 5. And then we just have 3. 3 occurs 0 times in 4, 0 times in 5, one time in six. And so that's going to be 60. And so if we wanted a number that had a remainder of three, we would just add three to this LCM because if this is the LCM, this number, every, each of our values can directly multiply into these values or this value is directly divisible by all of the values that we're interested in. Therefore, they have a remainder of zero when we divide the LCM by any of, the, any of these factors. So if we wanted a remainder of three with all of these factors, we would add three to the LCM, which would give us 63. If you have any questions, then please let me know. Otherwise, let's move on to seven. So Anita has three timers, or excuse me, Anita set three timers. The first beeps every seven seconds, the second beeps every 13 seconds, and the third beeps every 15 seconds. If all three beepers start at the same time, how many times over the next six hours will all three timers beep together? I keep on switching from beepers to timers, so let me just keep this consistent here. These are timers even though it's kind of similar, but whatever. So, if all three timers start at the same time, how many times over the next six hours will all three beepers beep together? I'm going to give you three minutes, and then I'll give you some hints.
Okay, so if we look at this problem, we really need to just find the LCM of the rates of beeping, because the LCM of the rates of beeping would be the rate of simultaneous beeping of all three timers. So let's factorize 7, 13, and 15. So notice that 7 and 13 are prime, so we can't break them down anymore. And 15, we can only break down into 3 and 5, which are distinct values from 7 and 13. So when this happens, when the values don't share any factors in common, the LCM is literally going to be the product of the values themselves. So we would take 1, 7, 1, 13, 1, 5, and 1, 3, which is the same thing as just taking 7 times 13 times 15. And so that means that the LCM here is equal to 1,365. So what does that mean? That means every 1,365 seconds, and only every 1,365 seconds will all three timers beep together. The second step here is going to be, I'm sorry, let me share my screen with you, scroll up here. So the second part of this problem is to convert these six hours that they ask about into seconds because our rates in terms of seconds. So I'm going to take 6 hours and put it over 1 because I'm going to be multiplying by some conversion units here. I'm going to multiply by 60 minutes over 1 hour. Notice how 60 minutes is the same thing as 1 hour, so this is really turning into something divided by itself. Anything divided by itself is 1. 1 times anything is that same something, so you're not changing the values here. You're just setting it up so the units convert, because notice hours will cancel with hours now. And so your answer, if you stopped here, would be in terms of minutes, but we don't want minutes, we want seconds. So you're going to multiply one more time by 60 seconds over one minute. I'm always orienting the value that I want to eliminate to be in the opposite side than the value that I... Uh, Making, excuse me, making sure that the units match up so the one that I want to eliminate, the units are in the opposite side. So minutes in the denominator cancels with minutes in the numerator. So now if you multiply this whole thing out, this is going to be equal to 6 times 60 times 60 seconds. So if you multiply that all out and divide it by the simultaneous rate of beeping, of 1,365 seconds and then interpret that answer correctly, you will have the solution to this problem. So I'll give you one more minute and then I'll give you the solution. Okay, so multiplying this guy out, if we have 6 times 60 times 60, that's going to give us 21,600 seconds. So I'm going to take 21,600 seconds and divide it by our rate of beeping, which is 1,365. 
and that's going to give us 15.82. Now you have to be able to interpret that answer. 15.82 means that they've beeped exactly 52 times already and that they're about 82% to the next rate of beeping. So they're 82% into that 1,365 seconds that it takes in between simultaneous beeping. But that 16th simultaneous beeping has not occurred, so it would be inappropriate to round up here. You have to round down when the context of the problem requires it. So the answer here would be 15. They've beeped a total of 15 times together. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Otherwise, these two problems will bring us up to the end of class. And actually, I'm going to just try and squeeze the other one in here. Let me see if I can do that. It's the same definition. I just copied and pasted here. So let me just see if I can slip it in here. So that's 8 and 9. I'm going to make my camera a little bit smaller so you can see that. Okay, and so these two problems will bring us up to the end of class today. I'm going to give you three minutes and then I'll start the problems for you and then I'll give you an extra two minutes and then give you the solution. And my apologies, I forgot to read the question again. Um, so the definition for questions 8 and 9 is as follows. For all positive integers h, let dollar sign h dollar sign represent the number of positive multiples of h less than 35. Question 8 is asking which of the following statements is therefore true? Dollar sign 8 dollar sign plus dollar sign 9 dollar sign is equal to dollar sign five dollar sign. Statement two says dollar sign five dollar sign times dollar sign nine dollar sign is equal to thirty. Statement three says dollar sign five dollar sign plus dollar sign eight dollar sign plus dollar sign nine dollar sign is equal to thirteen. And then after that new problem question number nine asks what is the value of dollar sign of dollar sign of dollar sign of six and then three more dollar signs so you're evaluating from the inside out okay I'll give you three minutes and then I'll give you some hints
Okay, so let me give you some hints here. First of all, notice how these statements are all using common... Oops, I didn't want to do that. Are all using um, common values or repetitious values. We have dollar sign, eight dollar sign, we have dollar sign, nine dollar sign, and we have dollar sign, five dollar sign. We don't have any other unique symbolisms here, so go ahead and specifically evaluate. Excuse me one second. My apologies. So go ahead and just individually or systematically evaluate all the unique values so you can just plug in and quickly determine whether the statement is correct. We're talking about, they're telling us here that when they wrap a certain number with these dollar signs, it no longer represents that value, but it represents the number of positive multiples of h less than 35. So dollar sign 8 the multiples of 8, or the m positive multiples of 8, are 8, 16, 24, 32, 40. Notice 40 is not less than 35. So there are 4 multiples of 8 less than 35. So hash to, or excuse me, dollar sign eight dollar sign represents the number four. Dollar sign nine dollar sign list out the multiples of nine. We have nine, eighteen, twenty-seven, thirty-six. Thirty-six is not less than thirty-five. So dollar dollar sign nine dollar sign represents the number three. And then we have dollar sign, five dollar sign. The multiples of five are five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. That's tricky. They said less than 35, not less than or equal to 35. So we may not count 35 itself. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So dollar sign, five dollar sign represents the number six. So if we were to substitute these back in, statement one would become dollar sign eight dollar sign is four plus dollar sign nine dollar sign is three is equal to dollar sign five dollar sign, that's six. Four plus three is not equal to six. So statement number one is false. Statement number two, dollar sign five which we now know is 6, times dollar sign 9, which is 3, is equal to 30. 6 times 3 is not equal to 30. So statement number 2 is false. And then number 3, dollar sign, 5 dollar sign, that's going to be 6, plus 4 plus 3 is equal to 13. That is true. 6 plus 4 is 10. 10 plus 3 is 13. So your answer here is going to be statement 3 only. And for number nine, we just want to be able to evaluate from the inside out. So first of all, start with hash, or excuse me, dollar sign six. So the multiples of six would be six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36. But 36 is greater than 35, so we wouldn't be able to count it. So dollar sign six dollar sign in the context of this question represents the number 5. So for this whole value, we can put in 5. So then that's going to turn into dollar sign of dollar sign of 5. And we know what dollar sign of 5 is equal to. That's equal to 6 again. We've already evaluated that up here. So for this whole value, we can put in 6 
And then we're just going to have to evaluate one more time, dollar sign, six dollar sign, that would turn into five. So they kind of do a repetitious sequence there. Okay, so if there are any questions, please let me know in either the live chat function or in the comment section below. Um, thank you all very much again for your support. I really appreciate it and getting me my uh, custom YouTube URL. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm always here for you. You can contact me on my social media or you can leave a comment um, below like I said. Otherwise, Tater Tot, you want to say goodbye? Come on, Dr. Tot, you got to say goodbye. Come on, up, up, up. Tell them how tall you are. <laughs> all right, thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you all um, tomorrow.